Hello, I'm Willie George. Welcome to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast. We're talking about the mystery of the church and the mystery of the return of Christ. And that's something that the Apostle Paul introduced. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. He was the one to introduce it. Here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul talks about this thing called the day of the Lord, the tribulation period, whether or not we as the church are going to go through it. So I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version, then we're going to jump over and read the words of a brilliant scholar and translator, Kenneth Wiest, who had so many good things to say about this. But let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Now, brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you. Now, now stop right here. The coming of the Lord is not complete without the second part of this sentence. There is this gathering together to Him. Now, I want you to listen carefully to how the first introduction or hint of the rapture or the catching away of the church was made, and it's Jesus talking about it in John chapter 14, and he likens it to a wedding. This is what he says to his followers. John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, why would he say that? Well, he was saying that you can't see God, but you believe in Him. You have believed in me because you've seen me. But he's saying to them, there is a time coming when you won't be able to see me, but continue to believe in me then. That's what he's saying. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, this is important. Jesus basically said, the only reason that I am going is so that I can prepare a place for you. I'm going to go so that you can be where I am. We're going to be together. Now, these are the words that every Jewish bridegroom, or particularly those who were Galilean, this is how they got married. They made a proposal or betrothal to a, a wife, and they, it's more than engagement. It's an espousement. Mary and Joseph were espoused. They had made a pledge to each other. The wedding hadn't been consummated. They were not yet living with each other. But there was a set time when they were going to come together, but they had been engaged. When this was uttered, when Jesus said this, he was saying that I'm going to make a room for you, and when it's finished, the Father will release me and I'll come. This is what uh, the, the, the Jewish custom was. But the whole purpose of his coming back was to collect the bride, to bring the bride with him, to come and get her so the two of them could be together. That's the idea. And so the appearance of the Lord, which is what we're talking about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what's its purpose? It's not just so that we're all down here together and, and, and uh, with the sinners and all the ungodly people in the world, and Jesus comes, and oh, there he is, and, and, and we know him. That isn't the idea. The idea is when he appears, he comes for us, removes us. That's the idea. Now, I want to read from Weist for just a minute here. It's uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2 and verse 1. Now, listen to what he says. Now, I am requesting you, brethren, with regard to the coming and personal presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, even our being assembled together to Him, not to soon become unsettled, the source of this unsettled state being your minds, neither thrown into confusion either by a spirit meaning a believer in the Christian assembly who claims the authority of divine revelation and claims to give the saints a word from God, or through a word received personally, as from us, or through a letter falsely alleged to have been written by us, to the effect that the day of the Lord, that's God's judgment, the day of the Lord has come and is now present. Do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way. 
because that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure of the church comes first and the man of lawlessness is disclosed in his true identity, the son of perdition, who sets himself in opposition and exalts himself above everyone and everything that is called a god or that is an object of worship so that he seats himself in the inner sanctuary of God proclaiming himself to be deity. Now, here's what all that means. The day of the Lord, the judgment can't come until the presence of the Antichrist. Antichrist has to be here for the day of the Lord to be working. He's a part of the plan. God is permitting him to come, but God won't permit him to come and is keeping him from coming because he is waiting to remove his church from the wrath that is coming to planet earth. He's not permitting his church to go through the wrath. That doesn't mean church doesn't have persecution. doesn't mean that the church doesn't suffer. Right now there's great suffering in the church in different parts of the world. Some places it's more sophisticated. Other places it's more physical. Some places it's both. But uh, the church is not going to go through that awful, dreadful time called the day of the Lord. Now, the departure of the church has to happen before the man of sin is revealed. And it talks about an apostasy. The Greek word here for departure is apostasia. Now there are two schools of thought as to what that means. Uh, let, listen to verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Listen to what Wiest says. Do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way because that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure of the church to heaven comes first. That's what he calls the apostasia. You see, uh, apostasia means departure. So which is it? The falling away of the church or the departure of the church to heaven? They're both right. And I do believe that there will be an apostasy of the church or some in the church who will fall away from truth, but there is also going to be an even greater manifestation, and that is the removal of the church to heaven. Now I want you to think with me for just a minute. If an apostasy, if the apostasy was all that was necessary to bring forth the Antichrist, it would have happened before now. You know why? Because the church has already had a number of apostasies. There was a horrible apostasy that happened after the first 300 years or so of the church where the church fell away from the truth. And that's why Europe went through this period of time called the Dark Ages. By the time Martin Luther came along, he had to fight to be able to preach the simple idea that the just shall live by faith. The whole idea and plan of salvation had been so corrupted that people thought they had to give money to the church to be saved. They bought off their salvation, which is ridiculous. But that's how bad it got. That's how much truth was lost. But Antichrist did not come. He didn't come. And when he does come, one of the things that he will do is walk into the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said it would happen in Jerusalem. It's called the abomination of desolation. And there in the temple, Antichrist will present himself to the world halfway through this seven-year period called tribulation. He will declare that he is God. There has to be a temple for that to happen. Now, I want to say this. There does not have to be a temple for Christ to come. Christ could come well before that time. The temple could easily be built after Christ comes for his church. So it is not the temple being built that we're looking for. We're looking for Jesus to return. This is the Christian doctrine of eminence. That is, Jesus could come at any moment. And so we believe that we have to be ready, looking for him all the time. And so the temple being built is certainly interesting. I love reading about stuff like that, but it doesn't have to be built in order for Jesus to come. Now, Wiest is correct, I believe, in saying that the Antichrist can't come until the church has been removed. Now listen to this. This is verse 6. And now you know what is restraining that he may revealed, be revealed in his own time. Now you know. Well, if I said, and now you know what we're having to eat this Sunday. 
if I haven't told you previous to this what is on the menu for Sunday, then my statement doesn't make any sense. So when Paul says in verse 6, and now you know what is restraining the man of sin, for him to say that means that somewhere in verses 1 through 5, he has told us clearly what restrains the Antichrist. Well, he did. What restrains the Antichrist is the removal of the church with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is not taken completely off the earth, but his great power and authority in the church is changed. I want to say something. I had never considered this because I saw very clearly in Scripture in the book of Revelation there will be millions of people, tens of millions of people who will come to faith in Christ. There will be preaching on the earth through the whole seven years of tribulation. There will be a huge harvest at the middle of the tribulation, a, a group of people that no man could number out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. But are they the church? And the answer is no. They're believers. They come to Christ, but they're not the church. The church is from the day of Pentecost until the time that the church is caught up at the rapture. That is the season of the church. I tell you, the church is a very special thing. If you've heard anything I've said in this series up until now, you see what a big deal the church is. It was a huge deal to God. It was a complete mystery even to the prophets. They didn't know about it. It was hidden in God's heart. That's Ephesians chapter 3. And so God kept this idea from being understood and revealed until the time of its fulfillment. So... Right now, we see that Christ could come at any moment. But when he does, it opens the door for this man, Antichrist, to be revealed. God, I mean, the devil has tried to bring the Antichrist forward. <clears throat> you see it in Hitler. <clears throat> you see it in Musa, uh, Mussolini, probably. Uh, uh, Napoleon wanted to be the Antichrist. Uh, there have been any number of world dictators who wanted to create one world government, have power, and do many of the things that the Antichrist does, but they didn't get to do it. They were stopped because they were not the ones who were supposed to do it. They caused great suffering, but they were not the ones. So the spirit of lawlessness is already here. The spirit that brings forth Antichrist, it's already here. But it can't do what it wants to do because of the presence of the Holy Spirit empowered church on planet Earth. Wow. So don't let anybody deceive you and take away your hope of the soon coming of Christ. Don't let anybody make you think that you're going to have to go through the tribulation. For what purpose? The, the whole purpose of tribulation is to bring people to a point of decision. Have you made your decision? Have you already received Christ? There's no real purpose then in you going through tribulation. You've already made your commitment. You've already said, Jesus is my Lord. The purpose of tribulation is intense pressure to bring every person on planet earth, first of all, to the knowledge of Christ, and that will happen in the tribulation. Jesus will be front and center. You can read it in the book of Revelation. He will be known. When all the judgments come, the people on earth will say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. They know what's going on. They know it's the judgment of the Lord. And so there is a time that you can avoid all of this, even after, yes, you can be saved, you might be martyred, you might be killed. That could happen even in this age. But my point is this, even the greatest suffering that we go through now, even in parts of the world where Christians are suffering, it's not to be compared to the tribulation, especially that last part. Um, it's going to be a dreadful period. But you know what? Here's the good news. God has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation. That means deliverance. And he's always done that. He lifts his people out of those places where judgment comes. It's all the time I have for today, but we're not done. We'll pick up here tomorrow, and we'll keep this going. I'll see you then.